Okay, uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, <clears throat> I would like to welcome all of you uh, for this year's spring school. Um, uh, just, I just wanted to uh, uh, mention one aspect of the spring school. Uh, this year, there are two, there are two special events. Uh, the one is the ICTP award ceremony, which is uh, today, and the other one will be the Rock Medal. This, this, both of these medals are very, both of these awards are very prestigious awards. Uh, so the Rock Medal will be next week. So this will be part of the spring school program. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, as you will notice from the program, that most of the days we have discussion session, and this is really an integral part of the school. Uh, in fact, I mean during the lectures, many times. If, if there are questions which require detailed answers, lecturers will not have time to answer the questions during the lectures. And the discussion, during the discussion sessions is the right uh, you know, time when you can discuss in detail various questions related to the lectures and also in general. So please try to come to all the discussion sessions. Okay, so our first speaker is um, Professor Aninda Sinha uh, from IIC Bangalore. And uh, he's, he's going to talk about uh, Conformal bootstraps in marine spaces. Can you hear me? So first, let me thank, begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to lecture here. Uh, I've been to Italy several times. Uh, to to Trieste, this is my third time. And it's, as always, it's a pleasure. So uh, the title of my lecture is, uh, is Conformal Bootstrap in Melon Space. Can you see this from the back, or should I write bigger? And uh, I essentially have uh, the way that I am counting two and a half lectures, so I'll uh, give a broad overview this afternoon, but uh, today I'm going to talk about background and uh, motivation. Um, so this will cover a quick review of basics. Uh, so the basics will cover some background of CFTs, uh, so which is basically in position space and the way that uh, bootstrap is usually done in position space. Uh, in, in uh, modern times. Um, uh, then uh, I will also say uh, why it may be in some sense natural to think about uh, CFTs in uh, melon space. I'll introduce what melon space is. And that uh, uh, needs me to quickly tell you about what is called the Simansic star formula. and uh, what are called Mac polynomials. And uh, so in, in the second lecture, which will be today afternoon, I will uh, give a broad overview about where this program is going. Uh, and then uh, in my uh, third lecture, which is tomorrow, I will uh, uh, give you more technical details about how Mellon Space Bootstrap is implemented uh, up to what we understand now. So this is... Uh, Lecture one, and this is lecture two, uh, lecture three actually. And uh, this program is being developed with, uh, in collaboration with a, a bunch of people. Uh, there is Rajesh Gopakumar, who is at ICTS in Bangalore. And uh, two of my students, uh, Apratim Kaviraj, uh, who is finishing this year and uh, who is going to work with uh, uh, Slava Richkov in Paris and uh, um, and uh, Kalol Sen, who's a postdoc at IPMU, uh, and also uh, there's some work that I'll mention with Parijat De, who's there in the audience, um, who's a postdoc with me in IISC. And uh, the the, the the main papers in this topic are so there's a famous paper. Well, now, by now famous paper by Alexander Polyakov in 1974. Uh, and the experts in the subject will tell you that uh, although in modern uh, literature everybody cites this paper, nobody really understand, understood it. Um, we, uh, with Kalosen, I looked at this work in 2010 
and we made some uh, inroads into understanding what this content was, but really the main uh, uh, understanding arose in a set of papers that we wrote last year. So these are already on the archive, and if you wanted, you, you could have a look at it. Uh, this is a short paper uh, which actually summarizes what uh, the key uh, ideas are. Uh, but the Mellon Bootstrap that I'm going to descri uh, describe both today, later on, and also uh, tomorrow is uh, based on some work in progress with uh, uh, Rajesh Gopakumar. Okay, so let me begin by telling you about what, what this program is, uh, a bit about background and motivation. So, what is, uh, what, what, what is it that we are trying to do here? So, uh, what we want is a Lagrangian free framework that can enable us to study and hopefully classify conformal field theories in dimensions greater than two. Um, we want to derive known and new results analytically and effectively, and it will become clear uh, what, what the kind of results that we've been able to derive uh, uh, using the bootstrap approach as, as we go along. So we want to make contact with what, whatever has been done uh, in the uh, diagrammatic approach uh, using the Feynman diagram expansion, and then we will see how to do the say, uh, similar calculations in a diagram-free manner and derive the known results and also derive new results uh, uh, using this uh, bootstrap program. Um, so the known and new results primarily that I'm going to talk about in, in these lectures are going to be for the wilson fisher fixed point in d equals to 4 minus epsilon in an epsilon expansion but without, using, uh, without having any Feynman diagrams uh, uh, in the intermediate stages. And uh, as will become clear that uh, the intermediate steps that I'll be using are going to be manifestly finite. But in the end, they will still uh, produce the same results uh, that Feynman diagram approach can produce and new results which the Feynman diagram approach cannot produce. And uh, more ambitiously in the future, we want to use this framework to address the issue about what is the, uh, how does string theory tie in all, that, in all this? So maybe I, I should say we want to explore contact with string theory. So the canonical example uh, is uh, second order phase transitions. And the canonical uh, example that I will discuss is uh, the critical point. And this is a phase diagram. This is the pressure temperature. So this is a phase diagram of water. Yes. I think it's more than, uh, I mean, uh, I don't have anything, uh, this comment wasn't meant for something specific, but then, of course, holography, so for example, we could address, there is a, in the large gen, whether there is a large gen, uh, will we always have a weakly coupled string theory in that sense, or is there something more? So for example, for the, even, even for the 2D Ising model, can we have a string theory, can we specify the background where we can define string theory? The canonical example is a pressure temperature phase diagram of water. Uh, and you know that the, there is a triple point here, but there's a critical point here. And then at the critical point, uh, we have enhanced symmetry. We have scale invariance. Uh, and uh, it's conjectured that we also have conformal invariance. And if we use the conformal invariance of uh, the critical point, can we make progress? 
Um, this point, so this is the uh, phase diagram of water, but then there are a lot of uh, other substances which have similar phase diagrams as a second, second order phase transition, which is associated with the critical point. Um, and there are, there are conformal field theories which describe the critical points. Um, the the universality, universality class of this is supposed to be the 3D Ising model. And uh, in field theory, uh, we start off with uh, a very simple scale of field theory. which is the phi to the four, but instead of being in uh, four dimensions or in three dimensions, we pretend that we are in four minus epsilon dimensions. Uh, and we do this because um, when we calculate the beta function by pretending that we are in four minus epsilon dimension, we get a fixed point, which is a famous Wilson-Fisher fixed point. So the beta function of this takes on this form. And uh, when you calculate the value of the coupling, where this is zero, uh, using this one loop beta function, this is the one loop beta function, uh, you get lambda star to be equal to 16 pi square epsilon by three. Uh, you want to be uh, in three dimensions, so you want to set epsilon to be one, so that you get the 3D or uh, get the 3D Ising model. But if you do that straight away, then you uh, notice that the coupling constant is 16 pi square by three, which is a very big number, so this is strongly coupled. And really, if you started off directly in, uh, in three dimensions, you wouldn't be able to uh, use any perturbative techniques uh, to uh, make progress. Oh, yeah. Correct. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, so what Wilson, Ken Wilson uh, taught us, or the, or the way that they actually made uh, some progress, is that you pretend that you are in four minus epsilon dimension, treat epsilon to be a small parameter, and you calculate uh, whatever you want to calculate. So for example, you can calculate the scaling dimension of the field phi, uh, and so this will, uh, because it's an interacting theory, it is not going to be the free field value, but if you do it using the techniques of quantum field theory, uh, using the galan simonsic equation and, and the like, then uh, you are going to get an expansion in epsilon. So if you uh, worked hard enough, and this, is, uh, this result is already there in the original paper by Wilson, and uh, this is uh, covered in the wilson Kogut review, uh, you're going to get these, uh, this result in uh, up to three loop order. So up to three loops, uh, you get rational numbers in front. And there are irrational functions that start appearing from epsilon to the four. So you get things like zeta three and the like from uh, epsilon to the four order. Um, uh, if you uh, set epsilon equal to one in this expansion, then uh, the value that you get is uh, 0.518604. But if you compare with uh, Monte Carlo or Nowadays, the most precise estimate of this number comes from numerical bootstrap, which I will uh, allude to later on. Then this number is 0 0.518151. So you can see that retaining uh, the three loops and doing this apparently illegal step of setting it equal to one, you get reasonable agreement uh, with numerical techniques. These numbers have also been measured experimentally, and uh, the agreement with experiments uh, for a large class of these uh, are pretty good. So this, is, this was a scaling dimension of phi. You can go ahead and uh, calculate the scaling dimension of anything that you want. There are composite operators. So for example, phi square is an example of a composite operator. You can calculate the scaling dimension of this using the same approach. And uh, there also, if you retain up to three loop results, the agreement with, uh, with, uh, with, with uh, numerical stuff is pretty good. So phi square is not the only composite operator. You can actually uh, consider uh, uh, composite operators with spin as well. 
So for example, you can calculate phi uh, with a bunch of derivatives, symmetrized and traceless. So L here it tells us the spin of this operator. So for example, if L was two, then this would be the stress tensor, which will not have any uh, an anomalous dimensions. By the way, the uh, whatever is, so this is, the fr this is the bare dimension, so this will be d minus two by two, and whatever is the deviation from the bare dimension is what we will call the anomalous dimension. Um, and all these uh, in the work of Wilson um, and Wilson and Fisher, which are summarized in Wilson and Covert Review, are known. Uh, so for, for, for scaling dimension of phi, the original calculation uh, was up till epsilon cubed. For these operators, the original calculations were up till epsilon square. Um, and people have, over the many, so many years, have uh, gone ahead and uh, calculated up till many loops. So I think the current record is up till six loop order, uh, which involves uh, hundreds of diagrams. So which uh, will obviously be tedious, and uh, any graduate student trying to reproduce them by hand, good luck. Uh, the drawback of this uh, diagrammatic approach, so calculating these will require evaluating a, f a bunch of Feynman diagrams. The drawback is that the Feynman diagram approach does not use the enhanced symmetry at the critical point. Um, so you first locate the the, the, the fixed point you, you, by computing the beta function, then you go and look at the cullen simon zeek equation and so on. And also, so the drawbacks are that does not use the conformal symmetry. And um, also this approach uh, is, it, it is very difficult to calculate what are called the operator product expansion coefficients. And um, I will explain, I will define uh, all these things a little bit better in a bit. So the, uh, the conformal bootstrap uh, approach is a Lagrangian free method that relies on conformal symmetry. So the bootstrap uses conformal symmetry. Um, and it's an old idea that was pioneered by, in the 1970, by Ferrara, Gatto, and Grillo, and uh, by Polyakov, and a lot of other people in the 1970s, at least the principles were there, although the equations that they managed to write down were quite hard to solve at that point and uh, as a result of which the program in the 1970s did not uh, proceed that far until the 1980s came and you ha have this famous work by uh, Belovin, Polyakov, and Zamologikov, which uh, addressed this issue in d equal to two. So this laid, uh, in higher dimensions, this program actually lay dormant until uh, this famous work by, in 2008 by Ratadzi, uh, Richkov, Vicky, and uh, Tony and Vicky. Which, uh, which, uh, which essentially uh, revived this program in higher dimensions, but using a numerical approach. Uh, there are lots of uh, nice reviews of this uh, uh, numerical uh, approach that exist in the literature, in particular by uh, Richkov himself and also by uh, Simmons Duffin, uh, which are available online. Let me uh, begin by summarizing very quickly some basics. <coughs> Are there any questions so far as far as the background is concerned, motivation? Please feel free to stop me and ask me.
Uh, I will only be covering material that I will need. So there are lots of, of course, more rigorous uh, 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 reviews that exist, and in particular, the big fat yellow book, uh, which is the canonical book that we start off with. So that may be a good place to start. So the conformal field theory, uh, the conformal algebra, in addition to the Poincare algebra, also consists of additional generators. Uh, the, the finite version of uh, the transformation, so this cons consists of uh, performing a very specific kind of uh, transformation where the new coordinates are allowed to transform in the following manner. So this is the, these are the usual translations. Uh, there are rigid rotations. If you are in Euclidean signature, or these are the Lorentz, uh, Lorentz transformations. Uh, so these are the, uh, the, the usual transformations that we have in flat space. But these are the new ones, which are uh, dilations and the special conformal transformations. So both of these are new. Yeah? Yeah. Sure. <coughs> So this is called the special conformal transformation, and this is very important. Uh, this will land up enabling us to fix a lot of things that would otherwise be not possible. So th this is dilations, uh, scale transformations, a constant rescaling. Alpha is a constant parameter. Uh, this is um, uh, special conformal transformations. Uh, so the generators of this are called P mu. These are the L mu nu's. Uh, the dilation, dilation generator is D. And uh, the special conformal transformations are called K mu's. Uh, they, they have a closed algebra among themselves. The two uh, important ones that we will need are the, uh, the commutator of D and P's. So that gives you I P mu and D with K, which gives you K with a minus sign. So just uh, bear this, uh, uh, this in mind. So the D with P has a plus I, and D with K has a minus I, uh, and that'll be important. So uh, with these uh, transformations, the first thing that we try to write down are conformal invariants or functions of positions which are left invariant by these transformations. all these transformations. So uh, it turns out, and you can convince yourself, uh, this, this uh, uh, special conformal transformation is responsible for what I'm about to say. Well, all of them are irresponsible, but the, the key player is the special conformal transformation, that in order to, con uh, uh, to, to uh, build conformal invariants, non-trivial conformal invariants, trivial ones are constants, but non-trivial conformal invariants, you will require at least four points. And uh, you get what are called conformal cross ratios. So this x12, or xij in general, square, is xi minus xj mu times xi minus xj mu contracted with eta mu nu. Eta is a Minkowski metric, um, or the Euclidean metric. So most of the time, I'll be working in Euclidean signature. So this could be just delta mu nu. So there is one which is called u, and the other one which is called v. And there are, for four points, there are only two independent ones that you can write down. And you can, uh, if you've never uh, seen this before, then you can take it as an exercise to use all these transformations to construct these uh, conformal cross ratios, and to show that uh, these are the two independent ones that you can write down for four points. 
you need four points, at least four points. When you have higher points, uh, you can get more uh, invariance. So if you have n points, then the in number of independent ones uh, turn out to be n into n minus 3 by 2. So if you put n equal to 4, you get 2, which are these UNVs. And these UNVs are going to play an important role in, in what I'm going to say. There are some transformations uh, for these UNVs, which are useful to make a note of. And these are easy to see. So the first transformation is if you interchange 1 and, one and 3, if you interchange 1 and 3, uh, just interchange 1 and 3 here, or you interchange 2 and 4, then uh, U and V exchange themselves, and that's easy to see. If you interchange 1 and 3, you get 2, 3 square, and this becomes 1, 4 square, so uh, that's what you get here. And if you interchange 1 and 3, this does not change. So U and V interchange positions. The other one is if you interchange 1 and 4 or 2 and 3, then you get one, uh, u goes to 1 over u, uh, v goes to v over u. And the last one is if you interchange 1 and 2 or 3 and 4, then u goes to u over v and v goes to 1 over v. Um, the other thing uh, that we will need are what are called primaries and descendants. Um, so you, uh, you define an operator to be a primary operator uh, of of dimension delta, so, uh, so so that its eigenvalue under the dilation operator is i times delta. And uh, if you remember, or if you see, the uh, algebra of d with k is, comes with a minus sign. So if I start off with an operator whose dimension is delta, and I consider a new operator whose dimension is k mu, then using that algebra, you can easily verify that the dimension of this new operator is uh, going to be delta minus 1. Um, and so uh, by repeatedly acting on O with Ks, I can constantly reduce the dimension which is uh, not desirable because I don't want the dimension to be arbitrarily negative. So any operator which is annihilated by this k, these k's, this operator is called a primary operator. And then again, with using the algebra, you can see that if I start off with the primary, so now if O is a primary operator, so let's call this primary, and if I repeatedly act it with the p's, then I will get a, uh, a new operator whose dimension, or the eigenvalue uh, of d, is going to be i times delta. So delta is the dimension of this operator, plus j. And so the dimension of this new operator is fixed in terms of the dimension of this old operator. This is just an integer. It labels the number of times that I'm acting with p. So these kind of operators are called descendants. Their dimensions are fixed in terms of the, the, the original operator on which you are acting with the p's. Is that clear? OK. The other thing that we uh, we need to know is that for a conformal field theory in any dimensions, 
the conformal uh, symmetry is powerful enough to fix the functional form of the two and three point functions. And this is a nice exercise to do. So you have to use uh, the symmetry transformations that I've written down there and the algebra of generators. Uh, so suppose I consider scalar primary operators. Say uh, I've got two of them, phi 1 and phi 2. Then the two-point function of phi 1 with phi 2, just from the symmetries, first, ju just from scale invariance and the first three uh, transformations, uh, the translation, rotations, and uh, dilations, you can convince yourself that this will be, so C12 is some number, and the, the position dependence is fixed. So if the dimension of phi 1 is delta 1, dimension of phi 2 is delta 2, then this is what you're supposed to get. But if you use, so this, this follows from just, uh, uh, using the momentum, L mu nu, and D. But if you use uh, special conformal transformations, then what you will find is that uh, it will demand that the, the conformal dimension of phi 1 and the conformal dimension of phi 2 have to be the same. Um, so you get some number times the fact that uh, delta 1 and delta 2 are the same. So if I write delta 1 is equal to delta 2 equals, equals to delta, then that's what you get. Um, this magic of fixing uh, the form of uh, this uh, two-point and uh, two-point functions also extends to uh, three-point functions. Three-point functions are also fixed. Questions now? Okay. Three-point functions are also fixed. Um, if you use just uh, just use scaling, then uh, uh, you will get uh, weaker constraint. But if you use scaling and special conformal transformation, then uh, you can show that this has to be some number, c one two three divided by x one two square, x two three square raised to a raised to b and x one three square raised to c, where a, b, and c are all fixed in terms of the conformal dimensions of these. Uh, so a is uh, just for completeness, I'm writing them out, but you, I don't really require them in anything that I'm going to say in the, f uh, in the future. So this is fixed. Uh, and although I've uh, told you this story only for scalar uh, primary operators, this is actually true also for operators that carry spin. So instead of uh, this, uh, what will happen is that there'll be more uh, uh, structures uh, but those, uh, fun the x-dependence of those structures are all fixed up to these numbers. So the, the fixing actually ends at the level of the three-point functions. For four-point functions, conformal uh, invariance alone is not enough to fix the functional form. At the level of four-point functions, so suppose I consider four identical scalars, then what you will get. So these are now identical scalars. So I've dropped the, uh, the index 1, 2, 3, 4 at four different points. Then uh, conformal invariance tells you that the form is this. So the conformal dimension of these uh, 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 identical scalar is phi, delta phi, delta phi. So delta phi, uh, for anything that I'm going to say in the future, will refer to the conformal dimension of this uh, scalar primary operator. 
And I will, uh, for the rest of the lectures, only focus on identical scalar four-point functions. And uh, you can actually, uh, with a bit of uh, algebra, you can actually uh, show that for the four-point function, you can fix the form to be of this kind, where you have pulled out a particular position dependence and uh, up to some unknown function of u and v. So these were the conformal cross ratios that we defined earlier on. Uh, this is the uh, conformal symmetry of this kind. You can only fix it up till this form. Uh, this function of u and v uh, is referred to as a reduced correlator. So if you pull this factor out, which depends on position explicitly, this factor cannot be written in terms of u and v. This is some factor that you can pull out. The rest of the stuff is going to be uh, only a function of u and v. Is that clear? Questions? OK. Now we also need to talk about the operated product expansion, because that plays a key role in uh, setting up the bootstrap equations. So operator product expansion. Uh, the operator product expansion is that a product of local operators, maybe local quantum operators, can be expressed as a, a linear combination of well-defined local operators you can take this to be an axiom and this is frequently taken to be an axiom in the axiomatic formulation of quantum field theory uh, specifically in, in our context this means that if I have a scalar operator say phi i and another scalar operator, say phi j, uh, then as you take x goes to y, then uh, this, this, this is an operator statement. This can be written as c i j k, which is a function of x minus y, times phi k y. So this c i j k is a c number function. And uh, inbuilt inside the C number function, the leading term uh, up to uh, normalizations that we specify uh, includes what are called the OPE coefficients. So you remember that I said that there are these primary operators, but also descendant operators. The descendants are written in terms of primaries by acting on them with derivatives, which are the p's. Uh, so we can actually uh, rewrite this equation a little bit. So there are some operators here which d are defined in terms of the primary operators, in terms of derivatives. So we can rewrite this by only summing over. So here we are summing over all possible operators. But we, here we can uh, use the fact that descendants are related to primaries by summing only over primaries. And there is some uh, functional which will involve uh, some uh, known functions uh, involving the derivatives of y. But now the operators that appear on the right-hand side are only uh, primary operators. And uh, exercise, you can try to show that if I have identical scalars, then uh, you can uh, write this. In this, this way, so I am taking uh, one of them at x, the other one at 0, and in the limit that x approaches 0, yeah. So 
So C12 k's are just numbers, which are called the OPE coefficients. So you can uh, convince yourself that up to these numbers, you can fix it in this form times x mu 1 dot x mu l. So these are just products of x mu, uh, mu 1, mu 2, x, x mu 1, x mu 2, x mu 3, et cetera, times some operator which will soak up these indices. Um, at zero, plus descendants. So that's the form. Delta, yeah, sorry, yes. Delta k, yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank you, yes, delta, it should be delta k. It's the dimension of this operator, yes. Plus L over two, yes. And also, uh, because these are identical scalars, uh, uh, this is the form that it, it will take. And you can also uh, convince yourself, and it's easy enough to see, that the, uh, uh, this will, uh, the, the indices mu1 to mu l will be totally symmetrized because of the way that they are multiplying of uh, these x's. L, l is, uh, at this stage, it's some, uh, it just follows from uh, the number of x's that I can pull out. So I've, I've pulled out a certain number of x's. And so this, this index that is there on this x has to be soaked up with another index. And it will turn out to be related to the spin of this operator. So L here actually is the spin of this operator. And also this particular combination, let me just introduce that here itself. Delta k minus L, uh, delta minus L, this combination is referred to as the twist. Okay, now this uh, functional forms of these p's are actually fixed. The way to fix them are that you first consider the three-point function. So when you consider the three-point function, uh, which is basically you take this form and you put in an O on the right-hand side, so that will be O, and there will be another O here, and then you take the expectation value, that will give you this guy. So this will be equal to, uh, so suppose O is a scalar operator just for concreteness. Then this will be sim simply equal to phi C phi phi O times the two-point function of O y and O z. And uh, now you know that the two-point function is fixed. So the right-hand side is fixed. So this is fixed by conformal symmetry. So you get one form, one expression. And, uh, but you also know that irrespective of this operator product expansion, this three-point function is also fixed by conformal symmetry. So this is fixed by conformal symmetry. This follows from the OPE. Now you can compare the two expressions that you get. And when you compare, you can fix this P. So that's one way of fixing the P's. OK. I'm sorry? Normalized, yes. Yeah, I, I, I'm assuming that it is diagonalized. You're right, yes. Yeah. OK. So in a conformal field theory, we frequently refer to as these objects, so which are the conformal dimension of all the operators that are there in the theory with their spins. And the OP coefficient, so all possible OP coefficients, these, these are what are called OP coefficients, these numbers. So these OP coefficients, 
These are referred to as the CFT data. And uh, when we say that we want to solve, uh, it means that we, are, we, we want to get all the numbers, all the delta i's and uh, the spins, and these numbers uh, to solve the theory. And the reason why we say that this solves the theory is because by repeatedly using the OPE, if I have an endpoint function, I can fully reconstruct the endpoint function with that data. You just have to recursively use the OPE. Okay. Questions? No, we want to solve for it, so we have to impose some additional constraints. So it will turn out, and that's what I'm going to come to in a bit, that uh, this, this is not the only structure, or only restrictions on a conformal field theory. There will be other things which we'll talk about in a bit, yes. So the other uh, ingredient that we will need are what are called conformal blocks. So you start off with phi's, and I will drop x1, x2, x3, x4. So whenever I'm writing this, I, uh, these operators are at x1, x2, x3, and x4. That is my ordering, unless and until I uh, specify otherwise. So I can uh, do the OPE twice. I can use these two, plug that OPE, and I can use these two, plug that OPE, and I will get CO square. It's square because the two-point function, because of conformal symmetry, uh, picks up only the uh, operators which are uh, same. So that's why it's CO square. There is no cross term. The cross term will uh, arise if you have uh, non-identical scalars. You'll get CO square times uh, two products of these guys. So I've, ju I've just, uh, just uh, used that OP that I've written there in this form. And I've done it twice. So you remember that when, when I said that conformal uh, symmetry fixes the form of the four-point function up to a function of u and v, using this, uh, we can actually define the conformal block. So I should put a fact that this is a definition of the conformal blocks using this. We have CO square times some function of u and v divided by this uh, func uh, the position dependent function that we pull out. So this conformal blocks depends on the operator O and the language that we're going to use that it depends on the operator that is getting exchanged. Um, and this G U V which is labeled by O is called a conformal block. It also is uh, sometimes referred to as a conformal partial wave, but uh, uh, or conformal partial wave. Yeah. Okay. I mean, but yes, that's true. Um, but uh, you know, in papers by Dolan and Osborne, they refer to this as the conformal partial wave, right? Yeah, and uh, I just now mentioned uh, the names of two people uh, from Cambridge, uh, Dolan and Osborne, did a lot of work in the early 2000s.
on these conformal partial waves. So they have got a lot of uh, important contributions trying to simplify the forms of these conformal partial waves. A lot is actually known, so these conformal partial waves actually satisfy a differential equation. Uh, so these GOs, UV, depend on delta L. They satisfy uh, a second order and a fourth order differential equation. The order is in uh, U and V. Uh, closed form solutions, by that I mean that uh, I can write it in terms of known functions, are only known in uh, d equal to 2 and d equal to 4. Uh, and also, uh, it's not in, in terms of explicitly, uh, in terms of U and V, but implicitly in terms of U and V. The actual dependence in terms, are in terms of these uh, new variables, Z and Z bar, or X and Y. It's not really a complex conjugate, but you can define new variables, Z and Z bar, through these equations. And uh, the closed form expressions, which, are, which look like product of hypergeometric functions, are in terms of the, the variables of these hypergeometric functions are z and z bar. Uh, the even dimensional uh, conformal blocks, d equal to 6, 8, et cetera, are actually built recursively out of the lower dimensional conformal blocks. So in some sense, even those are known. Uh, no useful closed form expressions for d equal to 3 uh, or odd dimensions are known. But nevertheless, there are explicit uh, forms of these conformal blocks that are known in any dimensions, not closed form, but explicit forms are still known in terms of sums over uh, various things. And uh, I will uh, uh, tell you a little bit more about that later on. But uh, that is enough of background material uh, before I tell you about bootstrap. So let me just pause, pause there and ask, are there any questions, technicalities? Confusions. Also, if you want to know about literature, where to study these more, I can refer to them, refer you to them in the future. OK, so I think uh, this is a good place to introduce Bootstrap. So uh, you have a four point function, and I could have done this. So let me just uh, explicitly write out the position dependence. And as before, we are going to. Uh, consider, again, identical scalar operators. This can be easily generalized to non-identical scalars. Uh, generalizing this, well, in principle, I could generalize this to any operators. But useful uh, blocks need to exist in order for us to make use of this uh, bootstrap conditions. Uh, so, the, uh, so let's focus only on identical scalars for now. So I, I uh, did the OPE by taking these two operators close together and these two operators close together. And uh, if this was a Euclidean correlator, then it doesn't matter where I place these operators. I could move things around. So in particular, I could have done the OP by taking the first and third and the second and third. So these arrows means uh, taking close together and doing the OPE. Or I could have done it the other way, taking the first and fourth and the second and third. So there are three different ways. It's convenient to uh, refer to these as, these as different channels. Uh, so if I, take, if, if I do the OPE in this manner, then I will call this the S channel or the direct channel. If I do uh, one and three close together and two and four close together, this I will call the T channel or the crossed channel. And one and four and two and three is the U channel, or it's again known as the cross channel. It's sometimes referred to as the cross channel. Now, it does not matter in which order I do the OP. All these should give rise to the same uh, result. So uh, 1, 2, 3, 4 should be the same thing as 1, 3, 2, 4. So in terms of blocks, we can rewrite this condition. And this is where we will make use of what happens when I swap uh, 2 and 4.
So v and u will interchange positions. So when I do this, uh, when I write to the right-hand side, I will get this uh, g o. But now instead of u and v, it will be v and u. And this will be x1, 4, 2 delta phi, x2, 3, 2 delta phi. And this is an additional condition that the four-point function has to satisfy, uh, which follows from associativity of uh, the algebra. And this is a non-trivial constraint. So this is supposed to hold at each point, each value of u and v. And of course, uh, if you do it at a random value of u and v, one of the sums, so th there's a sum here over the spectrum. So this is your summing over all operators. There are OP coefficients that are sitting here. And uh, there is no guarantee that the sum is going to convert, so you have to do it carefully. And if it does not convert, you will have to resort to uh, resummations or analytic continuations. And so uh, it's not completely trivial to uh, solve that condition. I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah, except that uh, one of them has u and v, and the other one is v and u. So you have to interchange the, the coordinates, the u and v coordinates. Yeah. Well, yes, it's, it's, the, it's simply the statement that I can move things around. And the order in which I'm doing things does not matter. This is also the statement of crossing symmetry. Yes, yes, this is uh, crossing symmetry. Crossing symmetry, uh, well, I mean, it just follows from the fact that these are bosonic operators, and it does not matter where I'm placing them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in the Lorentzian signature, there will be phase factors, uh, important phase factors, which we we are not going to talk about. Yeah, in time-ordered correlation functions, it's uh, trickier. Yes. Okay, so this is non-trivial to solve, and uh, what you do when you do uh, when you solve it numerically, it actually makes use of uh, typically makes use of numerical methods. To solve this equation, or uh, to look at these equations, I should say, look at these equations rather than solve, because what we'll land up getting are bounds. Uh, we won't get information about all operators un unless until there is even further input that uh, that are specified. So numerical techniques uh, there are there are essentially of two kinds. One of them is the original one by Ratarzy, Richkov, Tony, and Vicky, and there's also a more a, a less developed. Uh, kind, uh, which is by Gliozzi and collaborator, which uh, uh, deals with a truncated uh, version. But this also appears to be quite promising, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's less developed. This uh, version actually uh, gives rise to uh, bounds. And this version actually uh, gives rise to equalities, not bounds. Yeah, so in d equal to, in d greater than 2, typically there are infinite number of operators, not a finite number. So truncated means that you uh, put a cutoff somewhere. Domain, uh, region of convergence, you mean, uh, yes. That is important as well. And uh, as I said, that uh, you have to locate a suitable uh, reg region of convergence where actually you are allowed to truncate it. And uh, people have uh, analyzed those rigorously. So no, no, you just, you, you just say that there are no operators beyond a certain dimension in the spectrum. Just by hand, uh, you say that. Or maybe a more rigorous way of saying that is that those converge in a, to a small tail or something. So numerical techniques depend on these two methods. Uh, the, uh, the RRTV uh, gives rise to bounds. 
This essentially uh, looks at this equation around the symmetric point, u equal to quarter, v equal to quarter, one over four, one over four, and you expand these equations. Uh, so you look at this. There are uh, uh, rigorous analysis of convergence done by Richkov and collaborators. There is a 2012 paper and a 2015 paper which looks at the issue of convergence here. And um, they uh, further use what is called linear programming. And there are sophisticated versions, sophisticated uh, uh, extensions of this which, are, which, which look at, instead of the same uh, operators, uh, all identical scalars, that allows us to uh, do uh, non-identical scalars as well, which uh, depends on what is called semi-definite, sorry, semi-definite programming algorithm, SDPA. So SDPA, there are lots of people who were instrumental in developing this. Uh, this is uh, explained well in Simmons-Duffin's uh, review of last year. Basically, the output of this is that um, in the original version, you look at uh, what is the allowed leading order scalar in the OPE. So this is a leading scalar in the OPE. This is the dimension of the external scalar. And you also assume that the, this external scalar, which, you are, which, which appears in the correlator, does not appear in the OPE. So there's some kind of a Z, Z2 symmetry. Uh, and what you land up getting uh, are allowed regions. So uh, if you plot delta OS, OS is the leading scalar. Appearing in the OPE. Phi, phi, phi OPE. And you get uh, an allowed region. So typically, this region here is allowed. This is allowed. And everywhere above is not allowed. So this is the kind of plot that if you open this 2008 paper, you're going to see. But the more interesting thing actually happens in d equal to 3. So in d equal to 3, uh, you know, abuse of notation or so let's, uh, let's look at delta phi square versus delta phi. Or in the Ising model case, this would be what is called the epsilon operator. And this is what is called the sigma operator. Then in d equal to 3, something interesting happens. Uh, if you're looking at d equal to 4 or d equal to uh, 4 and above, you get some smooth curve. But actually, uh, for uh, dimensions lower than 4, this is actually true even for 4 minus something. This could need not be an integer. This could also be fractional. You can do this analysis in fractional dimensions as well. Then uh, what you get are kinks. There are kinks in the plot. So there's a kink here. And uh, quite remarkably, this kink actually appears to be very close to the uh, sort of uh, re reasonably known uh, 3D Ising model values for delta phi and delta phi square. So this kink uh, here, it appears at roughly 0 0.518. And this is 1.41 something, 412, I think. And this kink appears very close to that value. And so these people uh, uh, conjectured, and uh, because of the fact that uh, if you look at, study the king very closely in two dimensions, that agrees very, very closely to the 2D Ising model, which is known analytically. But if you look at the 3D case and you make a conjecture that the kink is where the 3D Ising model lives, then you can zoom into the kink, use other correlators, and make the allowed region here. So I said that you get allowed regions. When you start looking at multiple correlators, the allowed region becomes islands. So maybe some islands of this kind will start showing up. That does not happen in four dimensions or above, but in three dimensions, these become islands. So small islands. And uh, this island that you get by doing this analysis is actually much smaller than the error bars or error bands uh, that follow from the Monte Carlo analysis. So in that sense, uh, the numerical bootstrap is more precise than, uh, uh, than uh, any other known numerical techniques. Uh, how long do I have? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the next one is going to be a little involved, so I was going to talk about Mac polynomials next, but I think that's a bit, that's a good place to stop, yeah. So I'll stop there and uh, ask you questions. If there are some questions, I mean, short questions, because long questions can be postponed. Oh, today there's no discussion session. So perhaps you can, uh, you know, ask any questions you have. Okay, if right. not, let us meet, uh, say, in, uh, at 10.20. At 10